Good evening. Welcome to Gasson Hall. Welcome to Boston College. My name is Jonathan Lawrence. I am director of the Clow Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy and a professor of political science at Boston College. On behalf of Jim Smith and the Lowell Humanities Series, it is my pleasure to welcome you for this evening's discussion with Jamel Bowie, columnist for the New York Times and one of the preeminent public intellectuals of our current moment. I'm thrilled that BC history professor Heather Cox Richardson will serve as his discussant in tonight's program. This is the 11th Lowell Humanities event of the academic year in the 65th year of a valued tradition here. For information on the next Lowell Humanities Series event with Kim Stanley on the future of climate, technology, and society on March 29th, please see the Lowell website where you can sign up for their mailing list. This evening's discussion opens the Clow Center's two-day symposium on journalism and democracy. We are delighted to have Jamel Bowie as our opening keynote and similarly excited to be joined on campus by a number of other distinguished guests from news organizations and universities across the country. This symposium brings to a culmination a year that we have dedicated to the study of journalism's roles in contemporary democracies. Democratic societies have relied on the press to inform citizens about their political systems and to keep communication and deliberation alive. But a series of crises has rattled public confidence in the resilience of representative government at the same time that trust in news media is declining. Is the erosion of trust due to the spread of disinformation or to the decline of local news sources? Can the media serve as a set of guardrails for our constitutional order? Are journalism and democracy mutually reinforcing? An impressive lineup of scholars and experts will have much to say about these questions and more as our symposium continues tomorrow. The program runs all day Thursday and on Friday morning. Other keynote speakers include Ron Suskind, Charlene Hunter-Galt, and Maria Hinojosa. Please join us for more if you can. But now to introduce this evening's main speaker. Jamel Bowie joined the New York Times four years ago in January of 2019 after making a national name for himself during previous stops at The Daily Beast and Slate magazine, with extensive writings on racial politics, including the 2014 Ferguson unrest, the 2015 Charleston, South Carolina church shootings, and the Black Lives Matter movement, among other issues. He's been a political analyst for CBS News since 2015 and frequently appears on the Sunday morning show Face the Nation. He was chief political correspondent for Slate, a perch from which he consistently drove the understanding of politics deeper by bringing not only a reporter's eye, but also a historian's perspective and sense of proportion to bear on the news. Before he joined Slate, he was a staff writer and held fellowships at the American Prospect and The Nation, and his writings have appeared in the major storied publications of American journalism, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Time and the New Yorker. In recent columns, he zooms out from current events, including police accountability, gun violence, recent legislation targeting wokeness, to cover topics like how to engage in political friendship across divides, how to bring greater dignity to US politics, how to combat cynicism and reestablish the links between citizens and those who represent them. The weight of history is ever present, and he mines the 19th century for lessons and morals for our current challenges, bringing its concerns and its distinct language to bear on everything from economic redistribution to the state of race relations. What one first notices about his columns is that they demand more of readers, greater word counts, complex thought processes, all elegantly written in a medium form that goes against the soundbite culture. It is most unlike the previous generation of pundit who might fluff their way to a punchy conclusion that makes you nod your head. Reading Jamel Bowie requires a certain concentration of mind. He makes each paragraph count and brings rigor to the topics that he chooses. 
That he does so from the position of an opinion column grants him unusual license to combine it with a normative agenda, calling out the unfulfilled promise of freedom and equality. He shows how the past reveals itself in the present and how policymakers and citizen activists can seize the power of information to make a difference. And in so doing, he provides a model of one of the crucial roles of journalists in our democracy, in any democracy, really. After delivering his lecture, Jamel will be joined on stage by Heather Cox Richardson, professor of history at Boston College and an expert on American political and economic history. She's the author of six books on American politics, including most recently, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. And her new book, Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America, will be published in September. She is a leading Twitter historian, explaining the historical background of modern political issues through Twitter threads, and the author of the widely read Letters from an American a daily chronicle of American politics. After engaging together in conversation, Professor Richardson will open the floor to the public. At that time, please raise your hand if you have a question and someone will bring a microphone to you. I'd ask you at this point to please turn off your cell phones or noise-making devices and to please remain for the entirety of the program to avoid creating any distractions. I could not imagine a better speaker and a better conversation partner than Jamel Bowie whose work fits perfectly with our symposium. His address this evening is entitled, Defending Democracy, the Political Role of Journalism. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Jamel Bowie to the podium. Uh, thank you so much, sorry, I have no idea which mic I'm talking into right now. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here, a real pleasure to help kick off this symposium. I apologize ahead of time if I start speaking loud. I have like, I caught a sinus thing from my kids a couple days ago, so I can't hear out of this ear at the moment. Um, so if I, my volume gets a little too loud, just that's, that's what's happening there. I'm not losing my mind. Um, it is, again, a real honor and pleasure uh, to be here to have this discussion about journalism and democracy, uh, a topic that I don't write about very often, but I do think about quite a bit in this present moment, both as a journalist myself, both as someone who thinks that we are living through something of a crisis of American democracy and thinking about the relationship between the challenges facing journalism in the 21st century and the challenges facing American democracy. Now, whenever I do have the opportunity to discuss this subject or uh, am in rooms when, where this subject is being discussed, I, I notice that there are a few things that people tend to focus on, and for good reason. Often, when we are thinking about the problems facing journalism and the problems facing democracy, we're thinking about misinformation, and we're thinking about disinformation, about partisan silos. I was recently at an event where this was more or less the exclusive topic of conversation. How can we get Americans to take in more accurate sources of information? How can we challenge fake news? How can we make sure that people are hearing different perspectives than their own, getting outside of their ideological silos? And I think there is very good reason for why this seems to be the preoccupation when it comes to this discussion. We are, have all been witness to basically a political movement centered on fake news. We were all witness to the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, which itself was rooted in a set of falsehoods about what happened in the 2020 election, a set of falsehoods about what, is hap what was happening in the United States at the time. And we saw essentially what happens when many Americans are caught in these ideological bubbles of misinformation, these ideological bubbles of disinformation. And it's frightening. It's frightening to witness, frightening to think of what the consequences of that might be for American democracy. And it leaves us with some urgent questions. 
How can we ensure that Americans are getting accurate information? How can we help people resist conspiracy theories? How can we encourage readers and viewers and anyone else, again, to get perspectives outside of their own, whether that is through print media or broadcast media or social media? Now, I do think that these are important questions. I think these are worth grappling with. Uh, but I'm also not entirely sure that they are the most important questions facing US democracy and facing journalism in particular. Um, I'm not even sure that we, can, we should really think of misinformation and disinformation and partisan silos as kind of the primary problem facing American democracy. They are problems. Fox News and its considerable influence over millions of Americans is a problem. Social media algorithms and their ability to radicalize people are a problem. Uh, but while it is true that the scale of these problems is perhaps unique, right? Fox has a viewership of a couple million, tens of millions of people use various kinds of social media, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, whatever it is. I'm on TikTok even. Um, it's true that the scale of this is so much larger. It's also true that Americans have never been any particular strangers to misinformation, disinformation, and partisan silos. You can even make the case that it is objective media that is the unusual thing in the American experienced information, not misinformation and not disinformation. From the very beginning, of what you might call American political life, we, uh, the way we engage with our information environment has been marked by what you, would, you might call fake news. The information environment of the early American Republic, the 1770s and the 1780s, was saturated, rife, with conspiracies and misinformation. Some of this was because Americans at the time didn't have a sense that larger impersonal forces could shape events happening in their lives. And part of it was just because Americans at the time were extremely paranoid and believed all kinds of crazy things. The election of 1800 is instructive here. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite elections. It, it, strange thing to have a favorite election from the 18th century, but this one's mine. And I, I think it's so interesting uh, in part because it's a great example of negative campaigning, wild insults being thrown between the Adams and Jefferson's camps, um, but also because the political climate at the time was a fever swamp of conspiracies. You had Federalist supporters of Adams worried that Jefferson would bring about some Jacobin uh, terror on the United States. You had Republican supporters of Jefferson, the old style re Republicans, confusing, but Democratic Republican, I think is what they say now, um, who were convinced that Adams would impose a new monarchy on uh, Americans, on the United States. And in partisan broadsheets, in pamphlets, these ideas were just put forth all the time. They're part of the American political discourse. And again, something we would recognize today as being a form of fake news or a form of misinformation. If we move into the 19th century, we should remember that for more or less for all intents and purposes, there was no press but the partisan press. There was no objective press. It was Democratic or Republican, Whig, Free Soil, Liberty. Each party had its own papers. Each party had its own partisan, each paper had its own partisan perspective. Uh, Local political machines produce their own newspapers for their supporters. And again, in all of this, conspiracies and fake news and misinformation and disinformation is part of the, of the currency of the realm. On one side, for example, in the 1840s and 1850s, you have what was called the slave power conspiracy, the idea that there was a elaborate conspiracy of slaveholders who were controlling the federal government and trying to expand slavery nationwide. As a quick parenthetical, I'm not sure that was really a conspiracy as much as it was the case, but um, uh, it was understood as being a conspiracy at the time, and we referred to it as the slave power conspiracy. And then for 
slaveholders. They had the black Republican conspiracy that the Republican Party or the various anti-slavery parties were out to create social equality, to rise uh, the, the enslaved to the level of the white man and to, you know, to, to make the country a black man's country. And this, these, these, uh, these conspiracies, these views were circulated in papers, circulated in pamphlets, circulated in the media environment. If you opened up the New York Tribune in the 1850s, you would see a denou denouncing of the slave power conspiracy. If you opened up the DuBose Review, uh, down south in Louisiana, you'd see someone denouncing the black Republicans. Again, this is just how Americans engaged with news, engaged with information, not through objectively working through the facts, but through dramatic conspir <coughs> conspiracies, through dramatic uh, 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 misinformation, through spreading all kinds of rumors about their political opponents. This is just how things worked. Uh, we tend to remember the 20th century as the age of the broad-minded and objective journalists. But until the Second World War, until the Second World War really transformed American society in these very critical ways, the information of American life, information environment of American life looked much the same as it did throughout the 19th century. Tabloids and broadsheets uh, competing with partisan outlets and, and ideological journals. If we want to talk about the problem of fake news, we should talk about the fact that, for example, you know, William Randolph Hearst and, uh, and Joseph Pulitzer all but instigated a war in the 1890s through use of headlines, through use of sensationalism, through use of things that, we, again, we would recognize as being falsehoods, as being disinformation. I keep on harping on this because I really want to emphasize the extent to which problems of misinformation, problems of disinformation are not a modern phenomenon. We are not looking at a situation where something has suddenly changed in the American character, where, where we've moved away from some, thank you, where we've moved away from some, uh, uh, some previous error era of objective news that, for the most part, Americans have never engaged with the media in a way that I think we imagine in our heads. And to the extent that we ever did, it was for a very brief period in the middle of the 20th century when American politics themselves were highly unusual and less ideological and less partisan than they've ever been before for reasons that, in retrospect, weren't entirely Right. We took issues of basic human rights off the table, which enabled our political system to work in this consensus-driven way. But once those things got back on the table during the 1960s and 70s, we moved again towards partisan and ideological polarization. So our, our, our current world of misinformation, of disinformation, of partisan silos, of all these things, it might be a departure from the middle of the 20th century, where these large news organizations dominated national newsmaking, where, where there was something like uh, an objective mainstream news environment that people got their basic facts from. But it's a return to the world before that, a world where news was much more fractured, which must, was much more partisan, was much more ideological, and where Americans never really had a singular set of facts on which they made decisions about what was happening in the country. And if we're returning to an older kind of information environment, if we're returning to a time when misinformation and disinformation were just more a common part of American political life, then for me, it's difficult to say that these things are the problem, right? If they've always been here, and even if the scale is a little different, even if the scope is a little different, even if the mechanisms are a little different, if the basic phenomena has always been with us, then can we really say that it is the problem? I don't think we can. I think we have to look for other forces happening in American society, other things happening in our news and information environment in order for us to come to a conclusion about what has gone wrong in the present. 
Now, if we're looking for culprits, if we're trying to understand the forces that have severed many Americans from democratic values, that have rendered many Americans vulnerable to the spell of petty would-be authoritarians, then I think we need to look for a much more fundamental change in how Americans experience politics and experience the world. And I think that change, uh, put simply, is two things. It's the collapse, the almost total collapse, of local and regional news, and it's the collapse of any number of mediating institutions in American society that connect people to politics in a more concrete and tangible way. Let's re rewind back to the 19th century, the place where I feel most comfortable as a person. It's very strange, but <laughs> that's, that's what it is. In Democracy in America, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville examines the role of the free press in American democracy. It's kind of a consistent theme throughout the book, um, the free press. Because again, he's writing for a European audience. He's writing for basically a bunch of French aristocrats for whom the free press isn't really a thing uh, in the same way that it was in the United States. And so he's trying to explain exactly what this is and the role it plays in American society. And what Tocqueville concludes is that Newspapers in the press do basically two things. They provide information for people. That's straightforward. They tell people what's happening in their communities, what's happening in the world around them. But they're also, in an unusual way, constitutive of the people themselves. Uh, here's Tocqueville. It would diminish newspapers' importance to believe that they serve only to guarantee freedom. They maintain civilization. Now, what Tocqueville means here is that by disseminating information about the community and revealing the state of the community to itself, the free, the free press essentially helps create it as a thing and helps create the associations that act on that community and act within it. I, before now, like an hour ago, I spoke to some students and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in what I said to them, to y'all, uh, which is, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we don't really have a, a serious newspaper where you have a single outlet that has maybe one or two reporters and we have um, one nonprofit news organization. A couple years ago, a young woman in the community took it upon herself to start sitting in on every single meeting, city meeting that was happening. It doesn't matter what it was, city council meeting, uh, planning commission, the tree commission, all kinds of things. And she would write about this on Twitter and publish her notes as well. And so a bunch of people who are on social media just began following her and following uh, her notes about what was happening in city meetings. And an interesting thing happened among a lot of us who were following her, which is that we are newly informed about the things happening in our city government. And it turns out we have opinions about them. It turns out I have opinions about the number of parking spaces in the downtown area of Charlottesville. And having realized that we have opinions, having discovered that other people have similar opinions to us about what is happening in these meetings, what is happening in the city, quite a few of us took it upon ourselves to begin to get involved in actual city government, recognizing that you can just sign up to be on a commission, you can just start attending meetings, you can start speaking at public comment, all of these things. And it was this demonstration, essentially, of Tocqueville's observation that the presence of information, the presence of news, of the free press in this regard, helped not just reveal information about the community to us, but also created its own kind of association of people who wanted to now act on that community. Here's Tocqueville again. If there were no newspapers, there would never be common action. It often happens in democratic countries that many men who have the desire or the need to associate cannot do it because all being very small and lost in the crowd, they do not see each other and do not know where to find each other. Up comes a newspaper that exposes to their view the sentiment or the idea that had been presented to each of them simultaneously but separately all immediately directed towards that light and those wandering spirits who had long sought each other in the shadows finally meet each other and unite. 
A vibrant press, a free press, is one of those forces that help shape individuals into members of a community with responsibilities and obligations towards that community. It also acculturates them into political life and ties them to other like-minded people. It's one reason why when you look at the, the whole scope of American history, what you see is that whenever there's a reform movement, whenever there's anything like that, there's almost always an associated paper or media outlet. <clears throat> the uh, William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist, had the Liberator. Frederick Douglass had the North Star. The Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage had the Suffragist. The NAACP had the Crisis, and so on and so forth. It's not just that these were outlets for providing information about what was happening in the world of reform, but they also helped create the community itself and helped create the conditions for people to act on the basis of these ideals, act to try to do something about it. These papers and these reform movements did not just disseminate information, they bound readers in the common community and helped spur action and activism for their respective causes. And since I, I often think that the best way to see something happening is to see how the opponents of it react to it, right? to see what the opposition is doing about it, it is not for nothing that in the 1830s and 1840s, southern states basically tried to end the circulation of abolitionist papers in their areas. They tried to shut them down, burn down papers, burn, down, burn pamphlets, um, to commandeer the postal service to keep them from circulating out of the recognition that this is not just about the dissemination of information, it's about the creation of communities and the, creating the conditions for democratic action. I'll give one more example of this. If you go back to the beginning of the American Republic once again, there essentially is no patriot movement if not for the circulation of newspapers connecting Americans in the North and the South. Boston to, uh, to Richmond or to, or to Philadelphia. Um, David Ramsey, who was one of the first historians of the American Revolution at the end of the 18th century, observed that in establishing American independence, the pen and the press had merit equal to that of the sword. And this is a thing that participants in the revolution would observe as well, again and again. Now, for most of American history, the press was primarily local or regional or shaped by some common interest or all of the above. Uh, black outlets, for example, like the New York Amsterdam News or the Chicago Defender, were at once local papers catering to the black communities of their respective cities, and also national papers that spoke to the concerns of black Americans across the country. And this was often how things worked out. And then there were just regular local papers dealing exclusively with issues of concern to people in the locality or in the region. One of the most striking aspects of our modern information environment, and I'm not the first person to observe this at all, is this almost total collapse of local and regional news outlets. Where once most towns and most cities had a newspaper of some consequence, even small places had vibrant newspapers where there are multiple reporters reporting on the community, collecting information about the community, helping the community know something about itself. Now, in even mid-sized cities, that just doesn't exist. In where it does exist, those papers are much smaller, have much fewer resources than they did before. There are large parts of the country that when it comes to news relating to the community itself, they are effectively news deserts. And this isn't just a problem of not knowing what's happening with the, low, with the high school football team, right? <clears throat> This is a problem of not knowing what local officials are doing with taxpayer dollars. This is a problem of not knowing how your representative to the state house or to the state senate is voting. It's a problem of not knowing whether there's corruption happening in your local or county or state government. I think that this decline of local and regional news, which is profound, which happened very quickly over the course of just a couple decades as a combination of the internet and economic downturns ravaged the news business across the board. I think that this decline 
has played an important and somehow still underrated role in the decline in faith in America's democratic institutions. It's not just that the collapse of local news has made it more difficult to hold local officials and local politicians accountable, which it has. It's that the absence of that accountability, I think, has contributed to cynicism about the ability of people to ever act on government. The thing about local news, the thing about local politics, is that it's very direct, right? It's very concrete. You can very easily identify a person responsible for a problem in your community, whether that's an official, an elected official, an appointed official, whomever. You might even be able to very easily talk to them, to uh, uh, you know, harass them if you wanted to. I know for my part, my member of the House of Delegates lives down the street from me. <coughs> I can kind of bother her whenever, very easy. I can bother uh, the mayor because I see that guy all the time downtown. And that kind of connection to public officials is really important because it helps build a kind of democratic advocacy. You believe that you can actually act on your community. And part of facilitating that is local news, um, is the information that it provides uh, to understanding your community. As uh, the, the Brookings Institute had a, had a paper on this recently, and it observed that as Americans have shifted away from local news, <coughs> excuse me, turnout in state and local elections has fallen, and communities that have lost reporters have seen fewer candidates run for local office. And this sort of gets to what I'm saying. The, the absence of serious local and regional coverage kind of for lack of a better word, alienates people from the communities in which they live because they don't know what's going on. And they may not feel any the kind of the sense of efficacy needed to want to get involved in those communities. Instead of paying attention to what's happening around them, many Americans have turned to national news to close the gap. They may not have a subscription to their local paper if they have one, but they have a subscription to the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. And that's all well and good, right? Like, I'm glad you have a subscription to the New York Times. It helps pay my salary. Thank you. But you can't respond directly to national news. You can't. It's at a level of abstraction away from you. You can respond again to a city official accused of wrongdoing. The same isn't really true of a member of Congress or some random bureaucrat, or some person halfway across the country whose actions might be a matter of national consequence, but for which you can't really do anything about it as a person. The information we get from national outlets is valuable, but it can also leave us feeling hopeless and impotent. <coughs> it can contribute to what you can describe as political hobbyism, a tendency to treat politics not as a cause for action and an essential part of citizenship, but as kind of like a game, kind of like sports, something to pay attention to, to keep track of your team, to see how your team is doing. And for some people, to, uh, to root for those that, that embarrass your political enemies uh, and root for, root for people who make you feel good about your own political identity. Now, there's always been this element in politics, which is, I think, an element of entertainment. I think it's just part of living in a mass democracy. That's part of what mass media is. But for as long as there were these institutions, like local journalistic institutions connecting people in a concrete way to their communities, it was tempered somewhat. But now we have an almost total devolution of entertainment into politics and in political news. We have, in addition, an almost total absence of institutions <coughs> <coughs> to, uh, 
that link our political awareness to something more local and more concrete than national political conflict. We don't have local papers the same way we used to. We don't have powerful political machines of the kinds that could shape communities and act on them in a direct way. We don't have unions really anymore, at least not the kinds of union density we once had. And Americans don't engage in associations like they used to. We have churches, but participation in churches has been on the decline for some time. We have very little, in short, that makes politics concrete, <coughs> that makes politics, <coughs> excuse me, that makes politics concrete for people. And all of this is exacerbated by the lack and the collapse of local journalism. Which is all to say that rather than focus our attention on misinformation and disinformation, which just might be an endemic part of the American experience. It just might be that Americans love believing nonsense. Checks out to me. Rather than focus all of our attention on these elements of our contemporary political world, maybe we should turn our attention instead to the missing institutions and the missing, uh, the missing people, the missing journalists, that can help Americans better understand and mediate political life, that can connect them to things that are happening in their direct purview and try to turn political news and political information away from a hobbyism and towards something much more constructive. There are any number of solutions here. As far as local news goes, I think one thing that might be worth considering is that if the market just doesn't exist for local news outlets or even regional news outlets, then this might be a place where we act collectively through government to subsidize or provide some sort of subsidy to the creation of local news. I think it runs very counter to Americans' instincts about this sort of thing, the government providing money to news. But if we accept that news and local news, it's just an important part of making democracy work. And if we accept that the market isn't gonna do it for us, then there are only so many other steps to take. <coughs> if we take seriously the idea that the free press is constitutive of democracy, that it helps shape people into a public as much as it is, as much as it is responsible for informing them, then we need to think seriously about how to reinvigorate the press at the lowest levels. And again, federal subsidies might be the way to go about it. But there's lots of other things. And I think that in addition to thinking about how we re reinvigorate local news, we need to think about how we reinvigorate the kinds of associations that connect people to concrete political outcomes. Whether that is unions or some other thing that connects workers to to you know, workplace, uh, workplace democracy and also to political life outside the workplace, whether that is um, uh, any kind of civic association. There are many things in this regard that are missing from contemporary American life and which may go quite a ways towards explaining why it is that so many Americans are cynical about their ability to act on politics, cynical about their, their ability to act on democracy, and cynical about democracy itself. One thing that I strongly believe, firmly believe, is that democracy is not just a, a set of institutions. Uh, it's not just a set of processes. It is a practice, and it is a way of life. And to do democracy, you have to do democracy. You have to engage in it on a regular basis in your everyday life. It cannot simply be going to cast a ballot every four years or every two years. It has to be everyday experience with deliberation, with compromise, with coming together to find collective solutions to collective problems. Americans are increasingly unacculturated to that kind of democratic life. We don't experience it in our workplaces. We don't experience it in our communities as much. 
And if we're not experiencing it on this everyday basis, then of course we're going to become cynical about democracy. Of course we're going to begin thinking that maybe democracy isn't strictly necessary to be able to do what we want to do. The first step towards rebuilding that kind of democratic life, I think, is rebuilding the institutions that help people understand themselves and understand their communities. And that means starting with journalism at the very lowest level, at the very local level. Thank you. Push a little bit on that. Is there a distinction between objectivity and both sides in something? I mean, I think in, in how we, we tend to use the word objectivity, it's like it's, it's we, there's probably a precise way to think about objectivity in which that isn't, it isn't simply both sides saying, right? A, a way of thinking of objectivity that is um, trying to reveal the actual state of things. And the actual state of things may not necessarily have two sides to it. I like that. Um, but in practice, right, like in practice when, when people use the word objectivity, what they're talking about is sort of taking a middle position or taking kind of an above the fray position and then um, not even really adjudicating what's happening but simply offering up what's happening to readers for them to adjudicate. And I'm not necessarily sure that in, when it comes to questions of democracy that that is the right tack to take. So I have a, a, a little bit of a different question that pulls off your own work, and that is, while I am perfectly willing to deplore the loss of local journalism, uh, like I think everybody else does, it is, I think, something um, that your introducer referred to, that um, your, the journalism of people like you, the younger generation of journalism, tends to be far better informed in American history, in American patterns, tends to be longer form, tends to be much more in depth than what we might have seen 15 or 20 years ago. Is it possible, do you think, two things? One, that the reason people have lost track of democracy is because for a long time, we were just floating along on the surface and nothing seemed to have any meaning, and that they are regaining their focus on democracy in part because of journalists like you who are like, hang on a minute here, we actually need to look at reconstruction, for example. Has journalism changed for the better? That's a good question. Um, I don't, <clears throat> I mean, I know for kind of my cohort of opinion journalists that Part of what makes us a little different from some of our predecessors is that first we are we, we came to uh, we grew up in a world of like much easier access to information right like just just the internet and the research tools made possible by that and that really does facilitate I think a level of depth if you want to if you want to do it that might have not been as easily accessible for a previous generation of like opinion journalists. Um, you know, there, there are those of us who are interested in history, but even those interested in social science are able to like access social science in a way that just wasn't possible. Or the law, great right. new legal writers, some from Slate. Jaya Lithwick came out of Slate as well. Right. Um, I think that to, to, to speak to differing traditions of journalism, I know for the journalists that I've been in community with over the last 10 years, right? Many of us are African American, and we look explicitly back to the tradition of African American journalism in thinking about what our role is. Um, it helps, kind of, that um, we came of age um, at a point when there is a, this resurgence of black activism, right? There's Black Lives Matter and everything around that. There's black president and everything that came around that. And so that also sort of helps shape um, a consciousness. And I think it helps shape an historical consciousness as well. Um, so I think that's, that's part of what's happening there uh, as well. But I'm not, you know, I've, no, I've never had any sense of what the impact of what I write is on like people. I don't know. 
Um, I just, I'm just on my computer in my house. Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would say that it is changing, it, it is changed in journalism that is maybe spurring a greater interest in democracy. I think that might just be the product of like events. I, I, I think that the, the Trump presidency and everything around it really frightened a lot of people um, and really made people much more aware of and attuned to how fragile democracy is. Um, and that has led people to seek out voices to help articulate what's happening, what's going on, some of the work you're doing. So, uh, yeah, I think you're doing yourself a disservice on that. I think that the younger <laughs> journalists who are covering things with such depth and such intelligence have been, a, have been a game changer. Now, you know what I have to ask now, and that is when you say you looked up to other journalists, who were they and why? Um, so in terms of, like, contemporaries, uh, people... So the first person that comes to mind is ta Coates, who... I think was a real pioneer in bringing <clears throat> history and social science together as a journalistic tool, um, and not just background, but really kind of like reporting on history to make arguments um, for the general public. I remember reading uh, The Case for Reparations in 2014 and being impressed by the power of the argument, but also impressed by just like the structure of it. Like, oh, I didn't realize you could do that with history uh, in terms of making a journalistic argument. And that was very influential on me and I think very influential on a lot of other writers in my cohort. Um, someone I, an historical person, uh, I, I look back to uh, quite a bit, and I've written about this before, is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. I was wondering if we were gonna yeah, hear about W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, who is a very flawed guy, I mean, you know, he had his problems, but um, was a powerful social scientist, powerful historian, powerful journalist as well. Uh, and his ability to work in multiple genres and multiple fields um, uh, in order to make an argument uh, is something I look up to very much. I'm probably never going to be as good at, at verse as that guy was, but... Um, integrating social science, integrating history in a journalistic argument is something that he did very well and that I like continue to study um, when, I, when I think about my own writing. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to, to push out a little bit here because we are, I think, actually in a different moment than we've been in before and political scientists who are here will Back me on this, I think. They look at the concepts of politics coming out of political technology and the whole idea of instead of censoring what people learn, instead throwing so much at them that they can't, they no longer can distinguish what's happening in the world. And we know very well that that happened in the former Soviet republics and came to America and sort of they fed off each other. But people who are looking at that now wonder a lot what's going to happen when the virtual political reality that was built by those political technologists, people that um, Ron Suskind, I suspect, will talk about because he was one of the people to tumble across it early on here in America. Um, what happens when that virtual reality in which people live, people who watch Fox News, for example, or who follow Newsmax, or who follow the stories that came out of people like Steve Bannon, what happens when that world collapses the way it looks as if the Fox News channel um, or Newsmax might do going forward. Do those people, are they recoverable by journalists, local journalists or national journalists? Or are they angry and disaffected to the point that they will turn on the system that brought down their virtual world? And I know it's speculative, but it's something that I think keeps a lot of us up at night. Yeah. <clears throat> my, this is also speculation as well, but my, my sense is that the people really ensconce in that world, um, if and when it collapses, I'm not sure they're going to do anything. Because I'm not sure that something like Fox News necessarily engenders a sense of like efficacy 
in terms of your ability to act, right? It is all about pointing you towards enemies, pointing you towards the people keeping you down, external forces keeping America from being the way you want it to be, um, but not necessarily about saying, well, you have the ability to change this. It's really, well, if you continue watching this, we'll give you more information about why everything's so terrible. And I just don't think that, that that's the kind of thing that leads people to act when it's gone. I think it may lead people into despair and apathy, but not necessarily action. One interesting thing I've always thought um, was underrated about the former president, President Trump, is that part of what made him electorally potent was that he brought out lots of low propensity voters, lots of people who don't really participate in the right. political process at all. Um, but they, they came out for him. And my view of that has always been that it's because, unlike these news outlets, Trump did offer kind of the idea that if you vote for me, through me, you can like act on the system. I will be your, like, your avatar for acting on disrupting the system. Um, and that's a very powerful appeal. But it's not the kind of appeal that comes from Tucker Carlson. It's like not the kind of appeal that comes from Newsmax. The, what, what they're offering is an explanation for why your political team might not be ascendant, but no kind of sense of efficacy that you can do anything about it. Because that, that kind of runs counter mm -hmm. to, to their business sense. Like they want you to watch. They don't necessarily want you to do anything. They just want you to watch. Interesting. Um, I'm going to open it up now for questions to the audience. So who has something to say? Yeah, if people want to raise their hand, I'll bring a microphone, and we get a second mic going in a moment. Thank you. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your uh, speech. Um, my question is, um, you, you mentioned how uh, there are certain like events and things where you can't be necessarily objective or you know showing two sides this kind of idea and the, sort of the journalists have to be you know stick to one side and push this one narrative because it's important for you could say the protection of democracy but what I'm wondering is I guess who decides what like the truth is because obviously you can have one event where two different people were both experiencing the same event, but they have to two total completely different takeaways from the same event. So who would decide, you know, what's, what's the truth and what's like correct about something? And you could say, you know, the facts, but obviously people could see the same thing and have the same different takeaways. Um, and to me, it seems like almost like a slippery slope almost to say, something like this because maybe we could see something where we'll just, we could have one group of people who wants to push one narrative and they could say, you know, this is necessary for this and if you disagree, it's a dangerous maybe. And I don't, you know, of course, nobody would want something like that. So what, what, what do you think about this sort of idea? Yeah, so I, I guess to clarify, um, what, I, what I think is that there are times when to take an objective view is to actually have to, um, an objective view isn't necessarily a disinterested view, right? And so um, to use January 6th as an example, because I think it's a very easy example here. Um, is it true that people have different perspectives on what January 6th yet was? Yes, of course. Um, the participants, for example, thought that it was like, you know, they were, they were exercising their rights as Americans to petition the government uh, in, in a way they thought was appropriate. But I think that if you take uh, an objective view of what happened, which was a mob of people broke into the Capitol to try to like disrupt the tra peaceful transfer of power, I think that the way to talk about that uh, as a journalist is not to use words like, well, some say this is what happened, but to say, no, this is what happened, right? Like what happened objectively was a mob of people went into the Capitol, 
to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. And because the peaceful transfer of power is kind of the, the, the thing about that, 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 that's like the whole point of democracy. Like the whole point is to be able to have a peaceful transfer of power. Because of that, I think journalists should feel comfortable just condemning it outright um, because of a commitment to these basic ideals of democracy. And although there are differing perspectives on differing events, we do have some general agreement about what the ideals of American democracy are. Peaceful transfer of power, political equality between people, um, uh, uh, free speech, free press, freedom of religion, these things. And although there are plenty of cases where what those things mean is ambiguous, there are also cases when it really isn't. Um, I, I, I mentioned the African-American tradition of journalism in the country. Like segregation was an instance where it was actually very clear what was happening and what its relationship was to American democracy. And it was a failure on part of mainstream news organizations to treat it as something for which there were maybe two sides or for which you could be impartial. Um, and it was, it was a success of the black press that they didn't treat it like that, that they were very open about the fact that this is in tension with or in violation with the ideals we say we have as Americans. And so to some extent, there's gonna be judgment calls when you're, when you're thinking of objectivity in this way, but also there are clear, it, it, there are clear cut cases where you can say, this is out of alignment with, our, with the values that we agree upon. This is out of alignment with the values that we hold as journalists, and we should feel comfortable just saying so and not pretending that objectivity requires us to be entirely impartial here. Um, some of this, I think, should be a sense of self-preservation, right? Like the world in which you can disrupt the peaceful transfer of power is not gonna be a world that's gonna be all that friendly to journalists, and so, you want to prevent that world from coming to, coming to bear as much as possible. So we have a question over here. Hi, um, I actually work for an organization as an intern. It's Public Media Journalism for All. And um, I'm wondering, I'm a research intern right now, and I'm wondering what type of work can an association do like that for their local radio and news stations to try and increase the numbers of interactment and outreach that does encourage democratic values? What kind of thing can an association do? And myself and like all of us as individuals, what can we do to kind of promote what you're saying? Yeah. I, mean, I think in terms of what like associations and nonprofits can do is they can invest in local reporting and try to disseminate it as much as possible. I mentioned that where I live, we have a nonprofit news organization and they do as much as they can both to do reporting and then to put it out there through papers, through audio, um, through all sorts of stuff. And I think that's, um, I think I would, I would love to see more and greater investment from nonprofits and foundations in doing that kind of work. I do think that because <clears throat> this is a systemic problem, like it's, it's not, it's not simply that, it's not that people don't want local news, it's sort of like the, it, it is not sustainable to do it. Um, it requires sort of like larger collective solutions. Uh, but to the extent that individual people can do anything, um, I think right now it's like supporting local journalism where it exists and where you can. Um, my local paper isn't particularly good, but I still subscribe to it. I still you know, send, them, send them some dollars every month. And uh, I think that's, that's the kind of thing that we should work uh, uh, to support, all the while pushing lawmakers to take seriously the problem of news deserts. I think, again, I think this is a, a problem that demands a collective solution. Um, again, people tend to be allergic to the idea of public money going towards journalism, but I think that it's a potential solution, sort of like grants, right, for, like, for, for localities that want to um, create news organizations would be, would be welcome. Um, because although foundations and nonprofits can do a lot of work, I think everywhere deserves um, good local news. And 
the only way, the only, the only entity with the resources to make that happen is the government. Other questions? Um, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the subsidizing the news point that you were just touching on again. Um, could you talk about how people, like how governments could get people to trust these organizations when we're already in a climate, I think, where people are so hostile to even their local governments? Like I feel like we talked about, uh, Professor Richardson mentioned people who come in and talk about uh, books in their communities there's already a lot of hostility towards the local government. Would subsidizing the news be the best solution when people already have such a lack of trust? You know, like, have, has it already gone too far, I guess is my question. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in terms of creating and building trust, um, that there's sort of a chicken and the egg problem here, right? Like you would, you would build trust by simply doing the work and doing it well um, and providing a resource to people that they, that they value. Uh, and you would have to overcome, I think, the sense that there might be something suspect about like a subsidized news organization. But I do think that if focused on local news, you can kind of overcome this somewhat. Because the, the thing about local news, local politics, is it's like it's not as polarized as national stuff is. National politics is tied to people's identities, right? Local politics is tied to is someone fixing that pothole, right? Like it's so much more tangible and concrete. And I think in the same way, if, if imagine a world where, you know, in a community you can apply for a grant from the federal government to open up, um, to hire some reporters and do some local reporting. I think to just in the, in the, in the, uh, in the course of doing good work, you would kind of help build that trust and engender that trust. Uh, but again, there's a bit of a, a bit of a, a chicken and the egg thing here. Um, and like, it's worth. I mean, this is potentially one of the trade-offs. Right? Like one of uh, one of the trade-offs of having public subsidies for news gathering is that you just have to work a little harder for people to trust you. Um, uh, but my view is that that is a that's still a better outcome than one where they're just our news deserts to begin with, right? Like that the news deserts is that's the problem. That's sort of the issue. Um, and whatever solution we come to it, come to deal with it, is gonna have any number of trade-offs, but uh, we should want to come to some kind of solution. Um, because I don't think you can uh, say enough of how detrimental it is to the public good that, for example, many of America's state houses have no dedicated reporter core, right? There's no one really watching to see what's happening in state houses, which is insane, right? Like, you hear constantly about how state government is the most important to you because it's so close to you which would suggest that that's where people's attention should be, but in fact, you know, you are lucky if you live in a place where there are multiple reporters dedicated to telling you what's happening in the State House. So we can take two more, two, two more questions. One over here, Tyler. Uh, so, do you think that if there had been uh, well-established, well-resourced local news organizations at the start of the pandemic and in 2020, 
there would have been more digestible, less polarized science communication that might have been more effective in lowering mortality morbidity rates? Like, I guess I'm trying to apply your idea to a tangible circumstance. You know, I've not thought about that, but my inclination is to say yes, I think there would have been, in part because it would have just been like less polarized, right? Like, when you have information about the pandemic coming from the New York Times, which for a number of Americans, it's part of their political identity to be like, the New York Times is terrible, it's a partisan rag, I'm not gonna read it. Um, they're just going to, going to ignore it. And if they're getting the information from um, some other organization, some paper, some whatever, that is more in line with their political identity, that's what they're gonna to listen to. But in this alternative world where Maybe when it comes to their political entertainment, they're watching Fox News, but when they want to know what's happening down the street, they're picking up a local paper. And if they see people that they trust in their community talking about measures to counter the pandemic, they might take that a little more seriously. And it might act to, to counterbalance some of the more affective and polarized stuff that they're getting. Um, one of the things that I find, uh, and it's not like directly causal, I think, it's, I think it's more correlative, but still it's interesting, is that you know, there's been this decline in split ticket voting in American politics, that people, they vote, if you vote Republican for president, you vote Republican for, for everything, and vice for Democrats as well. Um, split ticket voting was much more common in the age of, um, well-resourced local news and regional news. And I don't know, I, don't, I, don't, I do not think that the decline of, of local regional news like caused the end of split ticket voting, but I do think there's a connection there in that when you are not learning anything concrete or tangible about your community, then the only thing you have to go off when it comes to casting a ballot are partisan cues, right? And so you're like, well, I don't necessarily know what's happening uh, in terms of my state rep, but they're a Republican and I vote for Republicans for president, so I'll just vote for a Republican here. That makes the most sense. And the, 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 the thing about um, news information that is more tangible, that's more concrete, that's more directly connected to your community is that it's precisely because it's those things that it can help temper people's inclinations to be you know, partisan or ideological or whatever, because people are always gonna be like that. But again, when it is, when, it, when you're, it's a different kind of thing when you're reading about potholes and like building maintenance than when you're thinking about, you know, what Fauci is doing, right? That's, that, 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 that's abstract, the other thing's concrete. And I think, I think a strong, culture of local journalism might have done something to, um, to get people to take, take the pandemic a little more seriously. Okay, so last question, anybody? Thank you both for really an excellent evening. I, I would ask you how uh, the concentration of wealth, growing corporate power, how these things may intersect with what you're talking about. And I'll just give you one example. And the Boston Globe has had a glorious history. And, and its decline, I would say, began with, when the New York Times took it over. And then it kind of hollowed it out. And it's really kind of an, a, a shell of what it used to be. And I've been reading it for 40 years now. So that kind of corporate uh, power how does that affect journalism, democracy? Yeah, you know, I think with, um, with local and regional news outlets, the thing you have seen over the last 20 years are basically like private equity firms buying them up and then gutting them, um, uh, uh, loading them up with debt or uh, uh, taking advantage of like the real estate holdings and selling those and, and, and turning a profit that way. I think, um, you know, in in Charlottesville, where I live, some capital group owns our local paper and is like systematically like taking it apart, um, sold it for, for spare parts, more or less. And the, 
extent to which our sort of like regulatory regime and our political regime kind of encourages this sort of thing, like makes this a profitable way of, of doing business <coughs> is obviously a problem. Um, but I think, you know, I, 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 the, the, the collapse of the business of journalism as a result of both like some you know, mismanagement, but also of just like larger economic forces um, especially kind of just the emergence of the internet, uh, like left the entire industry flat-footed. And it's in that environment that like these sort of like, this cor corporate power can kind of work its, work its will. And I think what Americans took for granted was that there'd always just be like a vibrant, news ecosystem. And what we've learned is that you actually have to tend to it. You have to like sustain it in some way, shape, or form. And to get to what I said a little earlier, if we can't necessarily sustain it through market forces, if in fact market forces are going to be corrosive to it, both in terms of just not being able to sustain the business journalism and again these corporate entities like using, seeing newspapers and other journalistic institutions as like quick cash grabs rather than, rather than anything to kind of sustain for the long term, then there has to be some other option. I know, you know, there was some uh, hope. A couple years ago, billionaires started buying up things like, what is it, Steve Jobs' uh, Lorraine Powell Jobs bought The Atlantic. Bezos, the Washington Post, and there is some talk of like, well, maybe it'll just be, maybe one upshot of our insane income inequality is that all these billionaires want a legacy project and they'll buy newspapers, um, which hasn't really worked out. And I think it's a testament to the, to the fact that if we want to preserve a vibrant free press, then we're gonna have to just act collectively to do it and find some way um, through collective efforts to, to, make that, to make that happen, to make that work. And again, maybe get over some of our hangups about um, using the state to, 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 deal, to deal with this problem, to deal with this issue. And I should say, just as one last note on this, we have these hangups about the state, but like, you know, ben, Benjamin Franklin ran a newspaper press, and he made his money not through selling papers to people, but by getting government contracts to print documents for the government. And so like, we do have something of a history of this like connection between the government and the press and one kind of like cross subsidizing the other. Uh, and that, that just might be something to look into and to think seriously about um, if we are serious about sort of, of, of preserving um, a vibrant press and not just having a handful of national outlets be kind of like the, the sum total of American journalism. I love working for the New York Times, I think we're a fine paper, but I think it'd be bad for the country if the New York Times were like the only journalistic institution doing the kind of work that it does. Well, thank you very much to Jamel Bowie. Thank you for these, these powerful remarks. Um, thank you also to Heather Cox Richardson for the probing questions and for exemplifying much of what uh, Jamel was speaking of. Uh, thank you all for being here. I encourage you to return uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for more panels and for keynote sessions uh, uh, during the day and on Friday as well. Uh, and I wish you all a good evening, and thank you once more to the Lowell Humanities Series for co-sponsoring. <laughs>